Hi, I'm Karina, the current president of Synbio Oxford. As a new academic term in year starting, we wanted to give this introductory talk to synthetic biology to hopefully help people from all disciplines catch up with this exciting field. Synbio Oxford is a student-led society based at the University of Oxford. We currently have on our committee a mix of undergraduate and graduate students, which are Samia, Scott, Megan, Jia Jing, Jose and Miro. We are supported by our senior member, Dr. Harrison Steele, and I'm proud to say that this year again, we are sponsored by Integrated DNA Technologies, which you may better know as IDT. The UK is really a great place to be if you're interested in synthetic biology. Our society is by no means unique. There are a number of other student-led societies across the country, and even a UK-wide one that you can join for talks and events. And the UK even has a number of research centres dedicated to the discipline. Globally, the interest in synthetic biology has also been steadily growing, with many regions and countries now having formed their own associations. But also economically, synthetic biology is becoming very important, with more and more companies also proudly branding themselves as using synthetic biology. Here I'm really just showing a few of them, many of which we have hosted at previous events. But now on to the main topic of my talk. What is synthetic biology? I think it can be quite complicated for outsiders or newcomers to wrap their head around what we mean when we say synthetic biology. And that is really not surprising at all, because when you search online and even in academic papers, you will be presented with many different definitions of what Synbio is, like the ones I listed here. So I thought for this talk, I should go through these different definitions and explain a bit what's behind them to hopefully bring some clarity into this matter. So the first definition that you may see frequently is this notion of designing and redesigning biological systems or organisms to give them new properties. Technically, I'd say humans have been redesigning organisms for millennia, sometimes changing them basically beyond recognition. But for the purposes of Senbio, of course, we would want to be a lot faster than that. Also, with breeding, for the longest time, we didn't even know what it was that we were selecting for, that it was these changes in the DNA that determined an organism's traits. And we certainly didn't have control over these genetic changes. Since the middle of the last century, we've been beginning to understand DNA a lot better and how it basically serves as a blueprint or a code for life. In every organism, there are stretches of DNA that can be read to produce proteins. So the sequence of bases in the DNA serves as a code which gives rise to a corresponding sequence of amino acids. And the sequence of amino acids then determines how this chain of amino acids folds into a protein. The structure that it ultimately takes on determines the function of the protein. And proteins can have many different functions. They can act as enzymes, which make chemical reactions go faster, means they are turning molecules from one thing into another. They can also assemble to form even larger structures, giving rise to materials like hair. Since the 70s, we have learned how to cut and paste DNA sequences. This has allowed us to transfer genes from one organism to another, this has famously been used to transfer the gene for human insulin into bacteria. Insulin, as I'm sure you know, is an important hormone to regulate blood sugar levels. So that's not something bacteria need or would naturally have. But transferring the gene into bacteria allowed us to harvest the hormone from bacteria, meaning we no longer had to get it from pigs and cattle. And the fact that it is identical to the protein produced in non-diabetic people means there is a much reduced risk of allergic reactions. So therefore, the vast majority of insulin on the market is produced in this way. This sounds like it fits this definition of redesigning an organism and giving it new properties, now doesn't it? But actually, this wouldn't be considered synthetic biology. The story of insulin would probably be an example of genetic engineering instead. Which brings me to the next common definition of synbio, combining biology and engineering. 
Although genetic engineering had the word engineering in it, it was around the year 2000 when scientists and engineers decided that it's time to bring some proper engineering into the discipline, giving birth to synthetic biology. I like to think of genetic engineering as this thing that, although it can work incredibly well, it's basically stuck in its specific context. The solution that you created for one problem would be very hard to apply anywhere else. So the new goal for synthetic biology was to create a framework in which you would break down your solution into standardized parts, which you can then reuse and recombine in different ways in order to tackle new problems. This increase in flexibility would accelerate the pace at which you can come up with new solutions. So the engineering principles I mentioned earlier are standardization, abstraction, modularization, and characterization. So once you've identified a DNA sequence with a specific function, which you would like to turn into a part, this function could be that it encodes a particular protein, you would modify it to an agreed standard format. That usually means modifying the end so that it can easily be combined with other parts, giving rise to the modular nature of this assembly process. At this point, you don't really need to worry anymore about the exact underlying DNA sequence of your part anymore, which is what we mean by abstraction. You can simply refer to it as your part for function X. In order to later have your protein of interest actually produced in an organism, you will then combine it with the appropriate regulatory sequences. And as all these parts follow a standard format, you can easily exchange them with labs around the world, and they would also be able to seamlessly integrate them into their own assembly workflow. A combination of parts can then be further abstracted as a higher level part. As an example, let's say that these three parts represent a protein which acts as a receptor for a specific pollutant that you're interested in, and also the regulatory sequences which are necessary to have it produced in a bacterium at all times. You can then combine this new part with other parts to create what we'd call devices. You could, for example, join this receptor with a part that produces a colorful or fluorescent protein upon activation. So once you put this into a bacterial cell, it could tell you when it has encountered the pollutant you are interested in in a water sample. Or similarly, someone else may have created a part that contains all the enzymes to break that pollutant down. Or because everything is designed to be as flexible as possible, there's nothing stopping you from putting them all together, which would give rise to a device that not only tells you when a pollutant is present, but also breaks it down. And if it's dynamic enough, it could even tell you once it has finished this task. And this is where this common definition of creating biological parts, devices and systems comes from. Lastly, and this is probably the most difficult step, you should characterize all of your parts, meaning that you should test them under a variety of conditions and then report their performances. Unfortunately, biology is really quite complex, so obtaining this information can be difficult because there would just be so many different conditions to test. For example, even the order in which you assemble your parts can change their behavior, or the exact strain of a bacterium that you use to express your device also makes a difference. Therefore, researchers still tend to go for this design, build, test and learn cycle. So you would start by creating lots of different designs of your parts and, and then building these constructs. And then you would test them. And from the results, you would analyze which of the designs behaved in the way that you intended and then take them through further cycles of improvement. So next is a definition which I encounter frequently that synthetic biology is using synthetic DNA. So we have the tools nowadays to print even quite long stretches of DNA with basically any sequence that we want. There are a number of companies now like IDT that offer this as a service where you literally fill in an online form, putting in the DNA sequence that you'd want to get out. Uh, you order it and they send it to you and you just have to add water and it's ready to use. 
I'd say technically it's not strictly necessary that you have to use synthetic DNA in this way. You could still make your parts by cutting and pasting DNA extracted from organisms, like in the example of insulin, and then use techniques to modify them to fit the standardized framework for your assemblies. But printing DNA has become so much cheaper in the recent years, it's really worth the time that you save yourself by not having to modify the sequences in the lab, but being able to do it on the computer and having it printed the way that you want it to come out. Also, as we get better at understanding how the sequence of amino acids determines how exactly the protein folds, we can print entirely novel sequences of DNA that will give rise to proteins that have not existed in nature before and perform novel functions. And now to the last definition, and this is one that I think is mostly found on websites that are already lean against synthetic biology. It's one that claims that synthetic biology is trying to create new organisms or life forms. But for the vast majority of Synbio research projects, I would claim that it isn't true at all. For most of them, you'd probably want to add a few genes and remove some others, but the organism that you're using is essentially still staying the same. But there are initiatives to build something that we call a synthetic cell. They're usually classified as either top down, where you take an existing organism and strip it of anything that's not essential to its survival, or as bottom up, where you're trying to find and add only the essential components together until you have something that replicates. These projects intend to help us understand life better. The attempt to make a minimal genome, which gave rise to Mycoplasma Laboratorium, for example, still contained over a hundred genes that we don't know the function of. They also aim to give us a less complex host organism in which we can then express our parts and devices in a more predictable way. So now that I've covered all the different definitions of synthetic biology, what is it actually good for? There are just way too many cool examples of how synthetic biology can make processes more sustainable or efficient or open up new possibilities. So here I'm really only just listing a few of them that I personally find very interesting. This device here, for example, will tell you about contamination of water samples with lead using a fluorescent output, and this would be much faster and more accessible than current methods. Similarly, you can freeze dry cellular components on a strip of paper. This one could tell you about the presence of a pathogen by changing color. This bucket that you see over here would contain insect pheromones, which were produced in yeast. So that means that you can lure pests into this trap, thereby protecting your crops from damage without the need to spray insecticides all over the field. Synthetic biology is also going to be big in the food industry. You may have heard of the Impossible Burger, which contains heme that was produced in yeast. That gives the burger a meaty flavor without the need to kill a cow. Other companies are trying to make milk with microorganisms, so similar to how we brew beer. So both of these approaches wouldn't just reduce animal suffering, there's also a lot of greenhouse gas emissions to be saved by avoiding the need to farm cattle. We can also use microorganisms to make pigments with which we can then dye textiles. And this would be much more sustainable than what we are currently using to dye fabrics at a large scale. You have probably heard that spider silk is an incredibly durable material, but we simply cannot farm spiders. But using synthetic biology, we may finally be able to obtain this very valuable fiber. There are currently also a lot of drugs and other valuable compounds, which we at the moment only get from undomesticated plants. So the production can be variable and limited, but by adding the genes to make these compounds into another organism which we can farm a lot better, we can increase yields and also improve the reliability of the production. But lastly, 
I do not want to gloss over some of the concerns and challenges surrounding synthetic biology. The illustration here came from an article where the author was very upset about the possibility of producing vanilla flavoring using microorganisms using Synbio. The author was arguing that this is going to replace naturally produced vanilla from vanilla pots, which would rob the farmers of their jobs. For this particular product, I'm however not convinced, because most of the vanilla flavoring you would find on the market is not actually made from vanilla pods anyway. It is instead chemically synthesized from wood pulp and petrochemicals. I do think it is a valid point to raise though with other compounds. We should be thinking, who is this going to affect? Similarly, the article claimed that all the sugar that would need to be produced to feed bacteria and yeast for biomanufacturing purposes is going to stand in competition with food production. But this is something that scientists are more than aware of, and there has been a lot of focus on photosynthetic organisms, on cyanobacteria, algae and plants for this reason. And there have also been successful projects to modify bacteria and yeast so that they can also take up CO2 from the atmosphere to make their own sugars. But of course, we won't be able to solve all of these problems with technical solutions, because some of them are simply ethical in nature. That's why I think it's so important that more people learn about synthetic biology and are probably informed about what it can and cannot do so that we can make these decisions as a society. And with that, I'm going to end my talk. So thank you for listening. If you're interested in more events run by Synbio Oxford, you can follow us on social media or sign up to a newsletter.